There's no guided notes for 7.2, right? Um, for 7.2, I posted this one and also this one. So you notice that, that this one it involves a little bit more drawing, other things that are harder to do uh, on the computer. It would be easier if you had a printout, obviously. Um, but we, you don't have to do any of the, the guided notes as long as you take lecture notes. But the guided notes do serve as a good way for us to talk about what was important in the subtopic to make sure that we understood all of those individual components. All right. So let's head out to the question set first. This might be a little backwards because, um, you know, if we're talking about the question set first, that means that uh, we might hit some things that we should have understood from the guided notes. But this will be a good way to make sure that we're hitting at least uh, the biggest topics. Okay. So. As you see here, I put the relevant command terms that are used in this question set at the top. You should definitely be familiar with these command terms. And I know I keep saying this, but these command terms will appear in all of your DP classes. So this is not just useful for ESS. I know that it's up in the air about taking the external assessment, but don't worry about the external assessment. Um, in ESS, we're uh, focus on, hey, you're going to be taking some external assessments next year, a bunch of them. So make sure that you're familiar with these command terms um, because they appear in all of these different EAs. So the first question, natural systems achieve equilibrium through feedback systems. Explain how feedback mechanisms would be associated with an increase in mean global temperature. What is the command term? Excellent. Thank you, Arden. Yes, it is explain. So we know that we're going to have to give some sort of detailed account, including reasons or causes. Right? That's our first clue as to how to best answer this question. Our second clue as to how to best answer this question is the fact that it's worth two marks. So we know that we're going to have to include at least two big pieces of information. So um, we know that explain is giving a detailed account, including reasons or causes. So it sounds to me like we need to give some details about feedback mechanisms and we need to include a reason why a feedback me mechanism would be associated with an increase in mean global temperature. So we just had uh, a bell work, what, yesterday about positive feedback. So can someone give us an idea about a feedback mechanism that would be associated with this increase in, in mean? What, what does mean mean? Average. So an increase in average global temperature. You have to be specific, though. You see this detail. It's not enough to say positive feedback. What positive feedback? What is causing that positive feedback? I see John Wick just joined us too. So we talked about an example of positive feedback the other day. Okay. So greenhouse gas emissions get trapped in the atmosphere. Um, that is something that increases temperature, but 
it doesn't quite meet positive feedback. Remember, positive feedback is where the thing itself causes more of that thing to happen. So you could use greenhouse gas emissions as a positive feedback loop, as a positive feedback mechanism, but you would have to explain how greenhouse gas emissions would lead to more greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, remember the example that we keep talking about, about the water and the ice. So what happens when solar radiation strikes or sunlight strikes dark water that's in like the Arctic? So when sunlight strikes that dark water in the Arctic, what's going to happen as a result? It's going to absorb more heat and that's going to heat up the area. Yes, it's going to heat up the area and what is on the surface of that water? Oh, ice. Yeah. So that ice does what? Melts. Uh-huh. And then because that ice melts, what does that mean about the total surface area of that dark water? Uh, it increases. Yep. And you can imagine that that just keeps going around and around and around, right? So that increases the amount of dark surface area of water to absorb that sunlight, which means that there's going to be more surface area of water to absorb sunlight, which means that there's going to be more surface area of water. And therefore, sea levels rise. It causes all sorts of other effects. But the positive feedback loop is when something happens that causes that same thing to happen over and over and over again. The only way you break it, the only way you break a positive feedback loop is either by stopping the input or by stopping the effect. We can't stop solar radiation. Can't stop there from being sunlight. But what we can do is we can stop that effect. All right, and what compounds that effect is the fact that the entire earth is warm and there is melting ice. So how do we bring down global temperatures? How do we stop climate change? Well, you just answered that in the bell work today. All right, human behaviors, how, how we behave. Right now, everyone in the world is doing this social distancing, this physical distancing, or at least most people in the world are. All right, 80% of Americans. We are changing our behavior in order to create a positive impact on human society. And so the same thing has to happen with climate change. Okay, so when you think of positive feedback, think about the very thing that is bad causing more of the bad thing to happen over and over and over again, all right? Unfortunately, in this case, isolation is good because it means fewer infections. All right, so let's move to number two. So let's do the same thing here with number two where we read through and we then figure out what the command term is. So it says with reference to figure five, so let's keep figure five up and let's figure out what figure five is trying to tell us. So what are our clues about what figure five is trying to tell us? It's showing the possible changes in agriculture productivity from 2003 to 2080. 
Excellent. Reading, reading the top there. Perfect. What, uh, what is, what is agriculture productivity? How fertile the land is or how, yeah. How well you can grow stuff in that area. Yeah. Beautiful. How well you can grow stuff in that area. So, uh, notice that 2080 hasn't happened yet. Right? So this is a projection. This is using data to model, to figure out what might happen in the future. Okay, so, so what we're seeing is that some areas, what, what is that negative 50%? Is that going to be um, a good thing for agricultural productivity or a bad thing? That's going to be a good thing for agricultural productivity. So, so a negative 50%. It's uh, yeah, a negative yeah. change. Bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's going to be a bad thing. There's going to be less productivity on that land, all right, due to global warming. So that means that the plus 35%, that's going to be a good thing for those areas. Let's try to identify what a trend is in this data. Before we even look at these questions, let's try to identify a trend in this data. So generally, where in the world are we seeing a reduction in agricultural productivity? Um, closer to the equator or closer to the poles? By the way, the equator is right here. Thank you, Alanis. Closer to the yeah, equator. closer to the equator. Warmer areas get warmer with global warming. All right. We know everywhere on Earth gets warmer, but warmer areas get disproportionately warmer with global warming. Here's something else that happens. Dry places get drier. Wet places get wetter. So if you're already close to a desert, then the likelihood that your area is going to dry up and going to be not farmable like these places in Africa, like these places near the equator in Southeast Asia, there's going to be a lot of problems there with agricultural productivity. Same thing with the Southeastern and, and parts of the Southwestern US. There's gonna be a lot of problems with agricultural productivity. Now, something that you notice is that the Northern United States is like, great, we're gonna be able to grow so much more because most of the northern United States gets a lot of rain. So we'll be getting even more rain, more snow. Wet places get wetter, all right? And uh, Lannis pointed out that uh, the continent of Australia, now keep in mind that uh, what you're seeing, you're seeing some very artificial lines being drawn because they are uh, dividing areas by uh, large regions, large regions that have um, varying impacts within the region itself. Most of the interior of Australia is a desert. So um, this is reflecting, I imagine these two regions are reflecting uh, the impact of climate change on the desert, which any area that is close to a desert is just going to drop in productivity. Like I said, dry places get drier. Over here. What we're seeing is that these places um, are also losing productivity. Again, they are close to the desert. Um, it is in the southeastern region of Australia that you see a couple of the big cities. Uh, it is also further south, closer to the pole, away from the equator. Uh, there's more productivity. It's going to get uh, more precipitation. Um, and so that's why this particular region is seeing a little bit better impact. All right, so you could make the argument that for some countries in the world, for example, Europe, uh, Asia, Northern Asia at least, that global warming is going to actually have a positive agricultural impact in some, in some ways. Um, obviously that is not good for the entire world, but it is um, potentially good for certain parts of the world. 
Now, obviously you don't have to do that huge analysis before you even start in on these questions. But if we understand figure five, then it'll make our lives a lot easier when we go down to these questions. So here's our command term. What do we need to do when we identify? I'll scroll back up in case you're not scrolling. Yeah, we don't even need to give uh, several points, right? In fact, an identify doesn't even need to be a complete sentence. An identify can be super straightforward, super succinct. So we notice that this is an identify question and it's worth one mark, one reason, that's it. So why might global warming cause a reduction in agricultural productivity? I mean, I might've just said it about five times, but what is one reason? Because in certain regions, um, if it's hotter or rainier, then you want to get more of that. So it's going to get worse. Good. Good. Excellent. And then it says identify one pattern in the predicted changes in agricultural productivity. So what is a pattern in here? And yes, Zainab, I agree. The temperatures in some places are not compatible with plant growth. Yeah, if you're closer to the equator, absolutely. The closer to the equator you are, the more you're going to have lower agricultural productivity. I wouldn't necessarily use the word suffer, right? Suffer is a subjective term. Try to keep it objective. Um, here we have uh, the second part of number two. Global warming predictions rely on an understanding of feedback mechanisms. Hey, there we go, there's feedback again. See, we're seeing this multiple times. So here's where you are going to define the term positive feedback. Again, the uh, command term here is define. So if we go back up, give the precise meaning, well, you know how to define, right? It's just saying, what you already know it define is. But just in your own words, you're gonna say what positive feedback is. Then you're gonna identify a positive feedback mechanism. Again, identify is just give that simple reason, that simple, um, in this case, positive feedback mechanism that we, one, one thing is what we just talked about. Um, and then we have outlined one way in which a larger world population may cause an increase in the rate of global warming. All right, we haven't talked about this yet. So the command term outline, what does that mean that we need to do? A summary or a brief like, account? Basically. Go ahead, Eunice. A uh, uh, outline means just like without covering every single topic, but like in, in, in detail, but adding, but just giving a uh, brief documentation of what it is like, not like just a brief uh, explanation of what it is. And what you said brief, that's the most important part. Okay. Don't spend your time on outline questions. Spend your time on explained questions. Outline questions, if, you, if you're writing a paragraph, you're writing way too much. So, outline one way in which a larger world population may cause an increase in the rate of global warming. So why would more people, just having more people, why would having more people cause an increase in the rate of global warming? Okay. 
Okay, now make the connection. So Zainab said we would be using more energy, demanding more energy. Absolutely. Uh, if, if I get my energy from, um, from fossil fuels, I might try to get more energy. And so how is that going to cause an increase in the rate of global warming? Just saying that, you, that you're gonna get more energy is not enough. Higher energy demand leading to What would higher energy demand lead to? Excellent. More greenhouse gases. Yep. So higher energy demand leading to more greenhouse gases, which traps heat. And you could even literally say what I just said. You, you don't have to put that into a nice, fancy, complete sentence, paragraph, anything like that. As long as you're making that connection, that's what they're looking for. All right, moving on to number three. Suggest one way in which the pattern of vegetation shown in figure one might change as a result of global warming. All right. So let's look at figure one and make sure we understand what's going on here. Uh, we've, this is a, a sort of a graph with some interesting data in the middle. What is the scale on the graph? Altitude, what does altitude mean? Height, great. So this is telling us how high a particular place is in meters. And just so that you have some idea of about how, how high we're talking about here. Um, 5,000 meters is, is about, um, wait, uh, 5K, that's uh, 3.1 miles. Because a 5K is 3.1 miles. Uh, so that's about uh, 17,000 feet, so 16, between 16 and 17,000 feet. All right, it's pretty high. Very few people have been that altitude. So at that altitude you have, uh, on a mountain, you would have permanent snow, snow year round, okay? Um, down below that, we see that there's an area that has almost no vegetation. And then we see what are called alpine meadows. Anyone know what that word alpine means? Good. Um, wintry, it definitely uh, reminds us of, of winter, all right? Because we often hear of like, during the Winter Olympics, the Alpine events. So, so these are regions that are um, in mountains. Mm -hmm. uh, it, yeah, you can think of it as having to do with, uh, with pine trees, absolutely, uh, because those are the sorts of vegetation that you would find in alpine areas. You would find coniferous plants, plants that do not lose their leaves. So alpine meadows, um, it's going to be a lot of you know, very, very short, uh, stubby plants that are really well suited to very cold areas. All right, and um, are able to survive all year round. Uh, you also get a lot of conifers, trees like pine trees. Okay, then you see Andean dwarf forest, and it tells you what that is. It tells you that you see shorter trees there, right? And then we see down below a cloud forest with numerous ferns. So what that means is that's a forest with taller trees. All right, with, with ferns down below in the, um, near the ground. And then there's, the reason it's called a cloud forest 
um, is that this is the level of a lot of clouds that come by and there's a lot of moisture available because of that. You think of it kind of like fog, all that condensation comes in. Um, and then down below we see a uh, dense forest with 25 meter trees. 25 meter trees are like 90 to 100 foot trees, right? Those are tall trees. And then down near ground level, we have a tropical rainforest. So as global warming increases, as overall temperatures increase, what might happen with where we find this vegetation on a mountain like this? What is the general pattern that we would expect to have happen? So this area up here between the cloud forest, for example, um, between like 2,200 meters and looks like 3,500 meters is defined by the fact that it's cold, right? If global warming increases, what's going to happen with the, the relative percentage of this mountain that is made up of tropical rainforest. Will it increase or will it decrease? If it's, if it's getting warmer. So it kind of works backwards from what you're thinking. It's going to increase. So this line that we see representing where the tropical rainforest stops and the dense forest starts, there's going to be more tropical rainforest because it's warmer. It'll, this area will be able to support tropical rainforest with a warmer temperature. And then this gets pushed up. This area will be able to support more of this dense forest with a warmer temperature everything gets pushed up and you can imagine you you think about the extreme if it starts getting warm up here there might not be permanent snow anymore it might be too warm to sustain that permanent snow okay so so when things warm up that means that the further up you go a mountain it typically gets cooler and cooler as you go up a mountain well that's going to start later and later the higher the overall temperature is. All right, moving on to number four. Again, any questions, throw it in the chat. Suggest one way in which the pattern of vegetation shown in figure one might change as a result of global warming. I repeated the same question. You get double the credit. I'm going to move on. I thought that was a different question. All right, uh, figure six below shows data to the risk, on the risk of life to property by coastal flooding in several different cities as a result of global warming. So we have here several different cities, all right? There's really, um, there's only a couple patterns here as far as what cities they chose. What is the biggest pattern that you can see about the cities that they chose. Keeping in mind this title here. Yep, thank you, Nadia. Surrounded by water or at a coast. 
Notice that Chicago isn't on here. All right, Chicago is an enormous city. Notice that Mexico City isn't on here. Mexico City is an incredibly huge city. But it's, not surra it's not on a coastline. Um, and so this is estimated number of citizens at risk in thousands. We know that uh, increased global warming will cause uh, melting ice sea levels to rise. Excellent. Um, and so this would be 2,787,000 citizens at risk from, from global warming, all right, from sea level rise, coastal flooding. And this is in billions of dollars what the potential cost in is. That means Miami is, st stands to lose $416 billion from coastal flooding. Okay, New York stands to lose $320 billion from coastal flooding. And we can see that cities all over the world are worried about this, not only because of the financial cost, but also the human cost. Okay, so state two reasons why global warming may lead to rises in sea levels, melting ice being one. And and what else did we learn about how global warming may lead to rises in sea levels? There's another effect, not just melting ice, but something else that happens with water as it heats up. Well, that would be the melting ice saying up, right? The glaciers on land melt into the ocean. It expands. Absolutely. When water gets warm, it expands. So all of these countries, all these cities rather, are at risk because of the expansion of water when it heats up. Okay, so those are the two main reasons. Melting ice and expansion of water. Now, that's worth one mark and it's asking for two reasons which means that if you only give one reason, so you don't get a mark. You have to state both reasons in order to get that one mark. Thank you, Mr. Tapp. I remember that experiment too. And if you miss that experiment, you can always look at it in uh, the YouTube videos on the, on the YouTube channel. Okay, any questions about the question set? All right, that's huge. I'm gonna to go to guided notes. Looks like we've got about 12 minutes. So let's make sure that we hit the most important points. Now we talked about the difference between climate and weather. Can someone really briefly remind us of what this difference between climate and weather is? Climate is long-term while weather is more like um, uh, short-term. Awesome. Climate is long-term, weather is short-term. Weather and climate, so 722, weather and climate are affected by oceanic and atmospheric circulatory systems. So this is, remember this is talking about how uh, there are ocean currents and there are air currents. And those ocean currents bring warm water to cold areas. They bring cold water to warmer areas, sometimes cold water to cold areas, warm water to warm areas but that the oceanic currents determine how much heat is in the air directly above the water. Um, I don't know, I don't remember if we mentioned this, but the major oceanic current that drives the weather in Europe 
is what's called the Gulf Stream. And the Gulf Stream starts with warm water in the Gulf of Mexico. Gulf of Mexico is that area to the southeast of Florida, of Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana. And that warm water actually drives the weather in Europe. It moves across the Atlantic Ocean and that warm water and that warm air ends up impacting Europe. If you look at a map and you look at how far north Europe is in comparison with the United States, just from the map alone, you would expect Europe to have really cold temperatures like Canada all year long, but it's not, it isn't. And that's because of a lot of those oceanic currents and those atmospheric currents. So weather and climate are, are affected by those things. If those currents shut down, if that Gulf Stream shuts down, Europe's gonna be cold. By latitude, Europe will end up being really cold. So if we impact the global system of oceanic and atmospheric currents too much, that will end up having huge climate impacts on individual regions and the entire world. So something to keep in mind. Uh, seven, two, three, human activities are increasing levels of greenhouse gases. Um, and it gives most of the information that you need to know right here. Okay, so leads to an increase in mean global temperature, increased frequency and intensity of extreme weather events. What would be some examples of some extreme weather events? Heat waves, floods, those are, uh, floods you can consider to be weather events. Yeah. What else would be a little bit, oh, there we go, hurricanes. What do we have here in Ohio? We really don't get hurricanes. Bye, Mr. Tao, see you in office hours. Tornadoes, absolutely. In Ohio, we got tornadoes and, and what's, what we see happening due to climate change, and yeah, typhoons are another word for essentially a hurricane, just you know, in, in different parts of the world. Um, but, but what we see with tornadoes is the more energy in a tornado, the more extreme it is, the more intense it is, um, and the more frequently we see tornadoes. Uh, we see that greenhouse gases cause uh, long-term changes in climate and weather patterns. We were just talking about that. And also a rise in sea level for two reasons. And make sure you have those two reasons written down in your notes. As we've seen, those two reasons come up in question sets and other things like that. All right, 724, the potential impacts of climate change vary from one location to another. We see all these reasons. Okay, so are which ones of these, so this is something to have in your notes, which ones of these impacts are we concerned about here in Cleveland? Which ones of these impact us the most? Damage to human health, 100%. It warms up, there's more ozone that we breathe in. There's more, more air pollutants that we're gonna breathe in. Also, it just gets hot. Heat kills during, the, during heat waves in the summer. A lot of people can't handle it. Are we worried about coastal inundation in Cleveland? Nope. Are we worried about ocean acidification in Cleveland? I mean, we're worried about them as global citizens, but we're not worried about, that's not going to affect our day-to-day -day lives as much, right? But 
We are worried about loss of ecosystem services. We're worried about the fact that, you know, trees aren't going to be able to survive at the same rate that they previously were. We're going to have different biodiversity. We're going to lose some biodiversity. We're going to lose some animals. Um, we are going to have different areas that can grow crops. It's going to be warmer in Cleveland. It's going to be rainier in Cleveland. Okay. So that's, those are the potential impacts of climate change for us here. Uh, we talked about positive feedback mechanisms. We did not touch on negative feedback mechanisms. So what would be an example of a negative feedback mechanism? This is really important. Make sure you have some notes about this. Negative feedback mechanism. Good, so that is, um, so Zainab's response, we sweat but replace the loss with water. Uh, that is a human negative feedback mechanism, all right? What would be a negative feedback mechanism associated with climate change? So negative feedback mechanisms correct themselves. So they, they don't loop. The one thing causes another which stops the whole cycle. Um, I think a way to think about it would be that as the planet warms up, um, certain places that where, where you might burn fossil fuels, you might burn oil in the wintertime in order to produce a lot of heat, you might burn less and less and less, right? You might burn fewer and fewer fossil fuels because you don't have to make as much heat because it's already warmer outside. We had a very mild winter this winter. So fewer fossil fuels were used to provide heat during that time. That's a negative feedback mechanism. Okay, so the result of that doesn't cause more of the problem. The result of that stops the problem from happening in the first place. Um, this one, you need to be familiar with your environmental value systems right here. Um, and finally, this one, remember we talked about different global climate models, that a lot of them are complex and that we cannot be certain about the accuracy of the predictions of these global climate models, all right? So you need to be familiar with what the global climate models are predicting and the fact that there is no one climate model that says this is exactly what's going to happen. They're all projections and they're all predictions based on previous data. Um, any questions about 7.2? We've gone over the guided notes. We've gone over the question set. Any questions in general? Um, I'd like to see more people show up for uh, our morning workouts and meditation and yoga. Uh, are there better times of the day? While I have your attention for a minute, are there better times of the day to have those happen? Uh, like, would you show up if they happen in the afternoons instead of first thing in the morning? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see if we can get more folks involved in those.
Okay. Morning's fine, All right? Well, I hope you stay healthy. Uh, uh, keep attending all these sessions throughout the day. And uh, Mr. Tout has his office hours from 11.30 to 12.30 if there was anything you still had a question about. Uh, if you're in computer science, stay on. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. Have a wonderful day.